All right, so let's also uh, see what the New International Version has to say about these texts. Ironically, Matthew 7.14, the New International Version gets that right. But let's go ahead and see what it said. The New International Version says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those which are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Those of us who are being saved, are you saved or you're not? Was this thing written by a person in the middle of a sinner's prayer who was in the process of accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Being saved straight out of hell. So, yeah, so this is the theatrics uh, that take place regularly in uh, Rager's um, church, if you can, if that's the terminology it will use, the Independent Baptist Church, that always has different backgrounds. So I think they move from place to place, uh, maybe different hotel th venues and stuff like that. But hey, uh, that's fine. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff you get, you get the NIV being thrown across the, the way uh, because of how the NIV rendered 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, so if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, and I know we've dealt with this before, the New American Standard Bible currently reads, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. I think that's identical to the NIV, so I guess that should be thrown across the room as well. The problem is that is a perfectly accurate translation of the Greek, which obviously Brother Rager would have no idea of and would not think that is all that relevant, and he'd probably throw the Greek across the room as well. Because 1 Corinthians one eighteen says, the word, the logos, of the cross, Stauru, twice men apalumenois, to those who are perishing. Now, this is a participial form. To perish is a concept found, in fact, the substantival participial form is, is used by Paul elsewhere. Those who are perishing is his description of the non-elect. They are perishing. They're in the process of perishing. They do not have true life. Where they will end up is destruction. And so the word of the cross is to those that are perishing, moria, foolishness, foolishness. Now notice, tois men apalu menois. Now if you know the language, you know men day. Men day is a standard grammatical form, but on the one hand and then on the other hand, in essence. So you have one thing, the word of the cross, the message of the cross. Two, indeed, those that are perishing, foolishness. But two, those that are being saved, soza menois, us, to us who are being saved, dunamis theu estin, it is the power of God. So one message to those that are perishing, foolishness. To those that are being saved, us who are being saved, power of God. So, does the message change? No, it is how that message is received and interpreted. And so, to those who are perishing, it is foolishness. Those that are being saved, power of God. Now, you're going to go down later, and he's going to say, no, to Jews, stumbling block, to Gentiles, foolishness, but to those who are called by God. So, this is about election. This is about predestination. Rager doesn't believe in any of that stuff. So, he wouldn't be aware of that type of thing. But the point is that you have tois apolumenois and you have tois sozamenois. So there is clearly and plainly an intended parallel in the original language itself. It's the King James that missed it. It's the King James that did not translate this with the clarity that the modern translations render it. So, perishing is descriptive of the non-elect in this life. They are separated from the life of God, and they are perishing. So, the message of the cross is to them foolishness. But to us who are being saved. So, here, in Rager's theology, in an independent fundamentalist Baptist theology, there is a overarching definition of sozo. Sozo means to save. It can also mean to heal, uh, to deliver. It has a 
identifiable but fairly wide what's called semantic domain of as far as its meaning is concerned. And so in the in the fundamentalist mindset, you are saved at a point in time, basically when you walk an aisle. You walk an aisle, you say the sinner's prayer, boom, saved. And they struggle with the Pauline reality of the now and the not yet. The fact that in Paul's theology, we're adopted, but we're waiting adoption. We're seated in the heavenly places, but we're still walking on this earth. Uh, we've been freed from sin, but we still struggle with sin. There's the now and the not yet. This is the reality of where we are now. They don't really get that. The idea of having an ordo salutis, the, the order of salvation, which is not just a temporal order. It can have temporal aspects to it, time-based aspects to it. It's more of a logical order where you differentiate between regeneration, adoption, forgiveness, justification, sanctification, the aspects of sanctification. You have to, you just simply have to deal with it in the New Testament that different New Testament writers use that term sanctification in different ways. You have to allow passages to speak for themselves. And that's one of the other problems with fundamentalist interpretation is that fundamentalists not all of them, but many fundamentalists believe that in the priority of first appearance, so in other words, when you encounter a term for the first time in the Bible, what it means there, they think needs to be read into every other text that comes after that. The result is abject confusion, but there are people who believe that. This is the first, first time we've run into it. Now, it doesn't work. John uses words differently than Paul does and Mark differently. And, and obviously the Old Testament uses things differently. And so it creates a mishmash, but they operate on that, on that basis. And so you put that kind of mindset together and you get this discombobulated, disjointed theology where you, you can't even start doing serious exegesis. Because if Rager was trying to do any kind of serious exegesis, of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he would have to go, well, this, this is a, a standard Greek formulation, mende. You have the same participial forms being used. Both are substantival. In the same case. And so they're being plainly put in parallel to one another. And so you'd either have to, if you want to avoid the descriptive participial element that is found in being saved, then you have to come up with some way of those that perish, or those that are perished, and those that are saved. That would be the only, only way to, to meaningfully try to maintain the parallel. Or to recognize that perishing right now, because Paul's talking about I go out and preach the gospel. People hear the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is to them that are perishing foolishness. But to we who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so it's talking about now in this life, the reaction that people have to the message of the cross is dependent upon their spiritual nature. And he's going to say, that's dependent upon the electing grace of God. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is going to be all about as you follow it through later on. But the point is, the accurate translation that represents the underlying concepts in the original language is the one that says, those who are perishing, those who are being saved. But his theology is, you're just saved. You're not being saved. There is no ongoing reality. That is why these guys don't understand why Paul writes the church at Rome and says, I want to come evangelize you. Well, they're already Christians. Why do they need to be evangelized? Because you only evangelize the lost, you see. Because it's all just a point-action thing. They don't realize that point-action thing initiates all sorts of other things which are part of the overarching concept of salvation. But 
they have a very simplified view that just simply does not correlate in any meaningful fashion to the text itself. So what do you do when you encounter an accurate translation of the text? You chuck it across the room during your sermon. That's what you do. But since I have encountered believers who have been confused by this, who have heard somebody saying this, like, uh, I felt it was important to address it. Once again, we have addressed it many times in the past, but to address it one more time uh, so that you would be aware of it. So thank you to uh, Pastor Rager for bringing this, <laughs> this issue up. 